What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Studio presented by Saratoga Spring Water. I have the incredible team behind the movie Radical. I had the pleasure of watching your movie in the privacy of my own home, and I fell in love with it. And it was one of the greatest joys for Sundance to start and then to be able to see the reaction from many, many people here that I had. And I just, I knew, I knew this movie was gonna have that effect here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm very excited about it. A lot of people here are very excited about it. Our audience who isn't in Park City right now might not know what Radical is just yet. So for anyone here who wants to do this honor, can you give us a brief description of Radical? Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, a description of the story, it's a, it's a story about uh, a teacher in uh, Matamoros, Mexico, which is a, a border town uh, along the border with Texas. Um, who uh, 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, um, was, you know, became a teacher because the only thing he wanted to do in his life was uh, inspire kids as he had been inspired. You know, we all have that teacher that affected us and, and in some cases they make you become teachers. Um, and he was a miserable failure. Um, nothing was working. He had a nervous breakdown. Um, and he decided to change his approach uh, desperately, rather by the seat of his pants, um, found a TED talk uh, on a you know, YouTube video, uh, which was basically that kids will want to learn about what they or kids will learn about what they want to learn about uh, and, and essentially to, to um, put the kids in charge of their own education, which means seed your own authority uh, and sort of give into the chaos of that. Um, and so it's a story of, of, of this one kind of incredible magical year where he where he did this and uh, starting with one of the lowest performing um, classrooms in the country, what he did in, in one year is it's it's truly unbelievable. Um, and it's a true story. And it's a true story. And um, um, yeah, uh, it, it, well, incredible. Incredible and hugely inspiring. Ben, I wanted to come your way now. I was reading the production notes and I believe someone had referred to this project as a second chance for, for Chris. So you find the article, you option it, and Chris had been off the grid for a little bit. What was it at that point that made you say, you know, even though he wasn't fully involved in the industry at that time, I got to go back to my friend with this particular piece of material? Um, yeah, I think he describes it as a second chance. I describe it as a great opportunity for us because uh, I had produced his first movie and I knew what he was capable of. And we had been talking for years for, for trying to find the right project. But I think this was a pro this was a, a movie that both wanted to be uh, kind of honor the genre of the teacher movie, subvert it, and also um, create a tension between that and a very naturalistic uh, story. And that's what he did with Padre Nuestro or Sangre de Mi Sangre. Um, and I knew he was capable of it. And he'd been living in Guatemala and he had been dealing with the education system there. There were so many reasons, but he was just the, the only choice for both me and Eugenio. I wanna to go to you now, Chris, and throw some compliments back. Ben's way, because another thing I had read, you said that Ben is the most committed and courageous producer you've ever known. What was the very first point that you realized that he had those qualities and you had to keep working with him? Oh, in film school. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I bring it up. <laughs> ben and I were classmates at uh, the Columbia Graduate Film Division, which is you know Columbia Film School, uh, where it turns out you went. Uh, so um, uh, no, I mean, uh, in the 66 incoming uh, student class that we had, uh, when you come in, you choose a nominal concentration. We had one. On day one, we had one person who on day one chose to be produce and concentrate, and it was Ben. And, and you know, we had a world-class Oscar-winning producing faculty, and it was like, uh, hey, buddy, you're gonna come in <laughs> under the wing. Uh, and they, they, they teach an approach to producing, which on its face might seem like it's seeding authority, but um, I think Ben is a, an exemplary example of, of uh, it's, it's actually an exercise in courage and uh, and that is to say, I think the work is to find the person with the vision. Uh, and that can be a process, that can be a conversation. It certainly has always been with us when a project is in development. Uh, but then you support the hell out of the vision. And, um, and that's what Ben does. And it's a lot of um, incremental, like he, he knows where he ultimately wants to get. 
uh, but he gets me there very gently. <laughs> so it's a process, but it's 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 a joyous collaboration. It really is, I and mean, it always has been. Such a perfect pairing of qualities for a producer to have there. Not to harp on the stepping away thing for a bit, but I, I did want to ask you another question about that, because in this industry, it can be very scary to prioritize self and to leave for a little bit and not be worried that you won't be able to have a path to come back. So for anyone else out there who might be going through that kind of experience and afraid to care for themselves, but then also realize the fact that that door doesn't completely close behind you, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. And it, I think it also applies to filmmakers that are here right now at Sundance, especially with their first movie, their short, what, whatever it may be. You know, I did all the wrong things after winning the grand jury prize, um, which is to say that that I think the the key thing is, you know, the, the industry is brutal. It can be unforgiving, um, but the but on some level it's irrelevant. Um, and that the, that what we have to do as filmmakers is to to do us, do you. You know, what what is it called you to this? What is it that got you there? And it's very easy, and there are there are there are very real logistics like you need to feed your family. Uh, which certainly was something that I experienced, uh, but but gradually it took me further and further off track, and I had to have a kind of self reckoning moment, which was like, wait a minute, I need to, I need to time out. It's very similar to the story of Sergio. I need to do this differently. I need to, I need to take another approach. And for me, that approach was, I need to just remove myself. I need to. I moved to Guatemala, where I've been living now for eight years. It's paradise. I love it. Uh, but it was a place and a space where I could come back, find myself again incubate my own things. And it was it was literally in that context that these guys called me with this project. And it was just like, uh, I mean, it was an incredible opportunity to come back. On some level, it was kismet. But but for me, to be honest, because I had worked with both of these guys with Sangre de Mi Sangre, it was like getting the band back together. I just, before I even read the article, which was amazing, it was like, oh, I, I hope it's good because I <laughs> want to work with these guys again. All right, you give me a good transition. Josh, I'm coming your way for the article now. So this isn't your first experience seeing one of your articles adapted into a feature film. So what's something about your experience with spare parts that you liked and you wanted to maintain when bringing your uh, your article to screen with Radical, but then also what's something about the story of Radical that demanded a different approach for you? Well, I think the, the thing that is probably two words, it's Ben O'Dell. <laughs> Ben's getting a lot of, a lot of compliments back to ben here, Odell. I like it. This is the Ben Odell show. Uh, so I had written a book uh, and an article in, in the aughts uh, about a, a team of, of teenagers who built a robot and that got turned into a movie by Ben called Spare Parts. Uh, and Dude. so, yeah, and it was, a gr it was a really fun process. That's where we met. Uh, that was 20, the process probably started in 2013 and mm -hmm. film came out in 2015. Uh, and I had just gone to Matamoros to report on this story of Sergio. And it, it, frankly, it didn't, necessarily, it didn't seem like a movie to me right off the bat. Um, I was personally interested in it. I'm interested in education. Uh, my wife is an educator. This is what we talk about all the time in our family. Uh, but Ben and I were spending a lot of time together on spare parts. And so I was telling him about this story in Matamoros, about this teacher who had reinvented the way he taught in a in a classroom that nobody was really paying attention to. And Ben was like, I think there may be something there. And it, it you know, it's not an obvious Hollywood movie. Um, I don't know, has anybody made a, a, a big movie, big Hollywood movie in Matamoros before? <laughs> I don't think so. I think this could be the first. <laughs> so, I, and I, when Ben expressed interest, I was so excited. Like, this is a, a an educator who is really provocative, who's doing great things, and deserves the attention. I could not agree more. Eugenio, you're up now. Oh my God, you're so good in this. You're so <laughs> good in this movie. So thank you, thank you. in a movie, we only get to see a, a slice of someone's life, and hopefully we could, we could feel their history through the prep work you had done. So what is something that you learned about Sergio who, you know, something that maybe we don't necessarily see in a frame or hear about via dialogue, but it was something that you held tight to and we could feel informing our performance to make his world and his experience feel whole. Well, uh, I feel I feel related to Sergio and, and to this story because uh, when we were preparing this uh, this movie, 
um, my background is, has been always as a comedian. I've been doing comedy my entire life. And um, when Ben brought this project to me, uh, it was a little bit scary. And uh, I knew that I had to, to change my method. And when I was talking to, to Chris about the character, I wanted to change my, my face, my hair, everything, right? Because I want, and he was like, no, 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 it has to be you, naked. And I was like, um, but I, I, Not exactly. I, 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 I <laughs> well, <laughs> um, without anything in, in my face or my hair. But uh, because I've been doing comedy, I wanted to really change. And he was like, no, change from your inside. So um, what I did was a, 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 an internal work, trying to find uh, Sergio inside of me. So it was, it was very, very complicated to me. Probably this is the mo most challenging um, movie that I've done because it's completely out of my comfort zone. I think you found a new comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you're yeah. feeling after the fact, but <laughs> I'm convinced you could do more within yeah. this genre and style and Absolutely. tone. <laughs> Jennifer and Mia, you're up. First off, a first feature is a big deal, so congratulations. Thank you. Going into your very first film, what part of the filmmaking process intimidated you the most and where did you find the confidence to overcome those nerves? A mí la parte que más me dio miedo fue una escena que está en la película donde hay como está Nico y Paloma y pues hay como una pelea, se podría decir. Las palabras que se usan ahí y el contexto de la situación fue algo muy fuerte para mí porque es algo a lo que yo le he tenido mucho miedo toda mi vida. Entonces fue como prepararme mentalmente y entregarme totalmente a lo que sentía Paloma, a lo que sentía hacia el miedo de que le podían hacer algo y lo que sentía que no quería perder a Nico. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not necessarily remember all of that, um, uh, uh, but it was a, the, the thing that gave her the most, the most fear was a scene uh, that she had to do with Nico that was after this, uh, this fight, this, this uh, moment where, where she has to go and kind of get him back. Um, and um, it, it went to a lot of difficult places that, that related to her own life. Um, and she had to um, um, sort of tap into something. ¿Y qué, qué fue la, de la confianza? ¿Cómo hiciste? ¿Cómo, cómo superaste? Pues con nuestra coach y hacíamos ejercicios y pues nos, bueno, me ponía a mentalizarme que todo lo que estaba pasando solo era actuación, que todo lo que estaba pasando iba a tener un, se puede decir, un fin bueno, iba, iba a ser algo que iba a terminar bien. So with, with our acting coach, we, we had an acting coach who was basically almost like a Zen meditator, which was to constantly just keep them present, keep them, I mean, they had no technique really yet, uh, but with that, that coach keeping myself present and to remind me that this was just acting, that this wasn't real, that, 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 that basically don't get yourself lost in it, that, that it was going to go away, that she could get through it. That's, that's how she got through it. You also? Eh, la parte más difícil para mí es, es una escena en la que estamos en el salón y hablamos sobre el aborto, porque yo me saqué mucho de onda cuando, cuando me dijeron de ese tema y, le, y me preparé emocionalmente y también con mi familia, recibí el apoyo y, y pues sí es un tema fuerte, entonces me preparé muchos días, investigué y hablé con, con mi nanita <ríe> y, con, y con mi papá y… Yeah. Bias. Okay. Entonces, uh, so, so the, the scene that I, the, that I found most challenging and most difficult was the scene uh, where she discusses abortion uh, because it was a, it's a loaded, uh, difficult topic uh, for her. And um, the, the way that she really got through it was to actually talk to it, uh, her family a lot about it, uh, do a lot of work. There were a lot of, a lot of conversations, but that process um, gave, gave her the confidence to... Learning uh, about this, yeah. Yeah. Doing research. Doing research. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and she did a bunch of research and got into the subject to or something else in this movie I can't get over it. the entire ensemble here is something else honey I'll throw this to you so you have a filmography that is wildly impressive and down to the floor so much experience but working with a young ensemble like this 
they're making their first features here. Is there anything that you saw these young actors do that you wish that you could go back and tell you when you were first starting out? Like, you, you could try that too if you wanted. Well, I probably, uh, the fact that they are not, uh, I, I, I was born in, in, in a family that was in, in the show business. My mom was like the soap opera queen in Mexico. Uh, so I was very aware of show business. Um, this is their, their first job for them. So uh, I found that the, the fact that they were not trained, it was good for us because they were natural and they were not conscious really of the cameras. Many, I mean, after three hours of being inside the classroom and, and being shooting with the cameras around, they forgot that we were shooting. And when I was a kid, I was always aware of the camera. I was too worried about that. So I would have loved to be like that, to be not aware that I was I, that I had a camera in front of me. The solution is three cameras, Eugenia. You don't know which one is <laughs> which one is which, and therefore you're always exactly. you're lost. <laughs> I, I like that tactic there, Chris. Can you speak a little bit to how this true story influenced, you know, the script structure, your approach to directing your actors on set, literally every element of this production? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, th the thing about the true story is that the 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 actual thing that happened, the actual result is literally it was like too good to be true and so when ben sent me the project the first thing i said is um hey we got to play this the other way uh we got to play against it maybe it's not even in the movie um what actually happens maybe it's not part of the what we're filming maybe that's that comes after um but but it it, it, it sort of uh, mandated i thought um first of all a very naturalistic realistic kind of kind of approach but but the other piece was like what if we tell this story truly from the perspective of the kids? Here we have the biggest movie star in the history of Mexico. Um, wouldn't it be radical if, uh, in fact, we enter the movie through their world and we see it through their eyes? And, um, and so filmically, the big joke on set was that our, our, you know, our, our uh, visual reference for the movie was Charlie Brown, you know, where all the, parents, all the adults are cut off at the head and it's wah, wah, wah. <laughs> um, um, so that like the kids, this is, you know, we're down in this little world and there's this world of adults and all this hectic stuff going on above them. And, and that, and to a degree it even antagonizes us as, as, as the audience that we creates this kind of numbness, this kind of noise, which I hoped would capture to some degree, the reality that these kids face there and where something like an education is almost an afterthought and it takes this light. And, and by the way, I knew when I got the project who I was writing it for that there was going to be this incredible light. There was going to be this fun, this humor, this joy that Eugenio just is literally in the embodiment of coming into that space. So I had those elements and it was just, to me, it was just a super fun uh, prospect and writing it was a joy because I knew who I was writing it for, you know? I just want to say that this is the first time in the history of Sundance that someone has used Charlie Brown as a reference <laughs> for their movie. I think we need to celebrate that. <laughs> it works very, very well. You, you emphasizing radical in your answer there is making me think of this because I'm, I'm always curious about coming up with film titles. It might seem like a little thing, but it winds up being incredibly important. Why that particular word? Is it because it was in the title of the article? Is there, is there any other word you consider? There's a huge disagreement about this amongst oh us. <laughs> um, no, which is uh, on the, the script, my working title was always untitled, quote, radical project. And that, that word radical was a reference to the subtitle uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the article. of the article on the cover of Wired Magazine, A Radical Way of Unleashing Genius. Um, and, and then one day, Ben was just like, you know, I mean, we were, so the shorthand for the movie was always radical. And then one day, uh, no, that's actually so the see that's why, we're, that's why we're arguing about no, this. No, he, we just found an email where I said, the title's radical. I think it's a great title. Way before. Well, I guess I was wasn't 20, in on the memo. Yeah. It was 2014. So, but as he likes to say, I take things slowly. I didn't want to hit him with the title too early. No, I was but, like, wait, is that the title? He's like, yeah, of course I'm, that's the title. I'm obsessed, A, with, with one word titles, because I think graphically they're so much better. B, it's a word that works in English and Spanish, obviously, so that's powerful. And C, the idea that the contrast between a teacher teaching children and the word radical and the irony of that, that you have to be radical to break through a broken education system. It, that was always my obsession, but I also knew there would be a lot of pushback, so I was very slow. And, and is it an ironic title, possibly? Like, is it really so radical? Right, exactly. You know? That's the thing. I was just having that conversation about one word titles with someone. I think it's true. It's like, it's like punchy, it makes its point, and it, it makes it unforgettable, too. So 
I always love, so I feel like we don't tell each other good job in this industry nearly enough and don't celebrate how proud we are of our own work nearly enough too. So anyone can jump in on this. Is there anything you saw someone either in front of the, the camera or behind the lens do on this production that made you go like, damn, you went above and beyond with your work and I am proud of you for that. Well, I mean, I'll just start with uh, Chris, Eugenio, these girls. I, I, I think everybody brought their A game to this. And it starts, I, I always feel like it starts with the director. And honestly, there's not a there's not an image in this movie, a choice of color, anything that wasn't really thoroughly thought through by Chris. And I think when you set that tone and you set that bar that high, everybody else rises to the occasion. Eugenio always rises to the occasion. But all these kids, they felt how much like a good teacher who cares will get kids to learn because they care about what they're doing. When a director is so thorough and passionate, it just sets a bar and that's why Chris is Chris and that's why we're all here. I love an interview where we're just like throwing compliments around to everyone. <laughs> well, we love each other. No, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's also, you make a movie about family, which this is. A teacher is a metaphor for a parent on some level. And the, the idea of finding family, creating family, you, you have to do that in the movie too if you want it to come off on screen. It's a process, but I mean, to me, it's the kids. I, I never, uh, you know, I thought we were gonna have to shoot around them. I thought the editing was gonna be a process where we maybe would find one out of seven clips where someone was not goofing off in the background or whatever. And that was not at all the case. They were so zoned in all the time. And again, they were working with Eugenio de Res. I mean, wh <laughs> these girls cried when, they, when we told them who they were working with. That's how, that's how insane it is. I'm gonna give you my last question here because I read this a couple times in the press notes just about, and like I get this feeling in interviews that I've watched that you've done, like you're so incredibly humble. Give me, whether it's in this movie or anything you've done, something you've done in a movie that made even you go like, damn, I'm proud of myself that I pulled that off. Well, um, it happened to me with this movie when I was watching, um, I, I saw a previous cut, but not this, uh, that it was the, the last, the final cut. So when I was watching the, the, the movie, uh, and uh, probably this is the first time I like what I did, especially because I'm, I'm always criticizing myself so bad. And uh, every movie that I do, I, I don't like myself. I, I, I don't feel I'm funny enough. <laughs> but right now, because it's a different genre, I, I, f I liked it. I think that's the first time I, 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 I say I, I that. work with him all the time. We do a lot of stuff together. That's a miracle. He never <laughs> says it. So even to admit it out loud is a miracle. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I love it. You should be proud of this movie and literally every oh, movie I've seen you. And my God, and all of you, huge, huge, huge congratulations on Radical, a seriously special uh -huh. film that I can't wait for the whole world to get to see. Amen. To everybody out there, keep an eye out for Radical and stay tuned. We'll have more Sundance 2023 interviews for you very soon. Radical. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you.